I know at this point you're probably worn out and tired of sitting and tired of listening because it's been a long couple of days, uh, but I'm going to work you over a little bit because I'm an activist, the fourth child in the family, so I was the littlest one and I had to be a scrapper, so that's who I am, uh, and I'm happy to be here and I commend all the great speakers that were here before me. Uh, they're the brain trust and... and Maybe I'm just a recruiter uh, in some ways, but I'm going to do a little exercise with everybody. Uh, and I know the crowd's sitting out and everything, but I, I don't get nervous. You don't have to get nervous. I'm going to ask um, everybody who is in this room, uh, who is a baptized Catholic, to stand up. Don't get nervous. I'm not going to hurt you. Everybody who's been a baptized, who is a baptized Catholic, stand up. Okay, just about everybody baptized Catholic, right? Okay, now, uh, if uh, any of you who are standing have not yet received the sacrament of penance yet, sit down. Anybody not first, first penance? Not today. I mean, have you ever received the sacrament of penance? You can, if you have, stand. How many of you have not received Holy Eucharist yet? If you haven't, sit down. First, first Holy Communion. Okay, so everybody's standing. <clears throat> all right, so all of you... Who are standing, has anybody here not been confirmed? Have you not received the sacrament of confirmation? If you haven't, sit down. All right, so everybody who's standing, we are, me too, confirmed Catholics. We are Catholics who have received the sacrament of confirmation. Now keep standing. All right, now if you were, all of you, confirmed, we were told what? We are Soldiers of Christ. Soldiers of Christ. Okay, so that means something. Now, if all of us here today were enlisted in the United States Army, this is what we'd have to do. We'd have to take an oath. Take an oath. And you don't have to take this oath. I'm going to read it to you, though. It's I, Stacy Vogel, do solemnly swear or affirm, you know, if you, if the, you know, Baptist, you don't want to swear, you affirm. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and all officers appointed by him. Don't sit down yet. Oops. Don't, don't, don't sit. Now, we don't do this in the Catholic Church because people get, you know, especially today, modern, happy party, go do community service, you're confirmed. doesn't mean anything. It doesn't resonate with being a soldier. And we are, sorry, you're a soldier. So the topic of my talk is, are you on active duty? Or are you missing in action? Or are you AWOL, absent without leave? Because you're in one of those categories. Pick one, you're, you're not in all three. Okay, let's say, and I'm not asking you to do it, but just keep standing. Let us say that when you got confirmed, you had to stand up in church before the bishop called you up and anointed you, and hopefully, I was or, uh, confirmed by a priest from South America because there were so many of us Catholics back then, they couldn't even handle us. And you're supposed to get a smack in the face to tell you you're going to get insulted for Christ you're going to get berated for Christ. You're going to get beat up if you are a soldier of Christ and living the orders you have. We have orders. And most people don't even know what the orders are. They don't even know they're a soldier anymore. Just go through confirmation, la da go home. Okay, so let us say, what if we had to take this oath? Okay, if at the time of confirmation we had to say, I, Stacy Vogel, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the gospel of Jesus Christ against all enemies in the church, out of the church, and in the government. Would that make a difference to you? If you had to stand up and do that, because technically you are. But we never take that oath. You just walk up, go to a ceremony, and you don't even, people walk out of there, have a party, they don't even know. So think about that. 
Maybe it's something for the church to think about. If you can take a solemn oath to become a soldier in the United States Army or Marines or military, and we don't take an oath to do that for Christ, our Savior, what's wrong with us? So now you can sit down. Think about it. Something to think about. Okay. So uh, anyway, so as I said, we are called the church militant, right? We are supposed to be militant. What does militant mean? Military? Okay, we're on the march. We're here to convert. We're here to expand. We are here to bring people into the faith. What do you think people, the missionaries who came here from Europe did? You, and, and we were out in some beautiful country. My husband and I recently said, look at the gorgeous country. But think about it, no roads, no streets, no buildings. And missionaries from, it, from Spain came here. They came here from France. They did not come here to, to, to build houses. They didn't come here to get lumber. They came here for what? To convert people to the Catholic faith. If you know anything, anything about Christopher Columbus, that was his objective, and now they defame Columbus. They hate Columbus, but he was actually a good Catholic. He wanted to find more souls for Christ. If you read about him, the truth, that's what he was here for. So what kind of church militant are we? Are we taking orders? We live in a rotten world. Now, I'm going to try and flip through these these slides that I made here to sort of distract you a little bit. And this is new to me because this is not my clicker. That belongs to the Fatima Center. So, okay, so are you... That's the wrong one. Okay, you're, you're enlisted. Okay, there's the three calls. Enlisted, missing in action, or uh, AWOL, which are you? Oh, here's what one of the priests said today. Um, he was talking about, you know, of course, we got to live the faith and everything, but one of the biggest things is this quote from the book of Hosea, which is uh, O.C. in the Catholic Bible. My people are destroyed or perish for lack of knowledge. Now, later on, I'm going to show you a slide of people going to the jihad or not the jihad, the Ramadan or whatever, you know, to Mecca. How many people are there? Okay. How how do they convert people? Now, had a great talk from Matt about the KGB and the and the Russians and everything. But look at this. How do you convert somebody today? I mean, how do you convert somebody today? You don't. Most of us, unless it's your life work, and for some of us it has been, because that's what the nuns taught us to go do when I went to grade school ages and ages and ages ago, probably far beyond most of you. But what do you know about the faith? What do you know about how to approach people? What do you know about how to talk to somebody? I mean, everybody out there is a prospect, is a convert to the faith, no matter how bad they are. Do we pray for the conversion of a Soros? Do we pray for the conversion of the big O who sat in the White House with his vacationing wife? Do we do, you know, there's, there was a billboard on one of these churches, turn your cares into prayers. So even if you can't just go out there and do something, you should be praying. When, when you see the, the sign and you want to go scream about the monstrosity that's been corrupting our government, we're saying, say a prayer for them. I mean, prayer is powerful. The rosary is very powerful. So, Next slide. Okay. Our Lady warned of the spread of atheistic communism. So we heard detail work on atheism, communism. What is communism? What does it mean? But it's Marxist objectives, right? What are the Marxist objectives? Destroy the family. What is, what is the family? The building block. The family is the building block of our, our nation, our culture, our church. The family is the building block. And it was in Rome until Rome messed up the family. When the family went, Rome fell. There, in the Library of Congress, there's actually uh, something the youth of our of our country, our you know our, our future, something better spoken than that. But basically, what was what were the Marxist objectives? To invade the church. Anybody knows anything about Bella Dodd? What were her Marxist uh, her, her Marxist uh, orders? Go into the churches of your ancestors and work from within to destroy the church. When she testified before the House on American Activities Committee after she converted uh, back again to the Catholic faith from Bishop Sheen, what did she say? We were successful beyond our wildest dreams in invading the hierarchy and the church. That's sworn testimony in the House on American Activities before they trashed Joe McCarthy. They had to because he was on the right track. So what is the anchor of family life? Stable marriages, stable, stable homes, secure children, which is a healthy nation. Now, 
Who's spoken out against this? We've heard all kinds of Catholics. You know Leo the Thirteenth's um, encyclical Humanum Genus. It, 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 everything is in there. If you haven't read it, re- read it and memorize it. It's fantastic. But in 1965, okay, here we have a speech by Paul Harvey, 1965. He was a Protestant radio broadcaster, and he did a little talk called If I Were the Devil. If I were the devil, I mean the prince of darkness, I would want to engulf the whole world in darkness. And going on, I would not be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree. It would be necessary to take over the United States. Right? Why? And, and this is, you know, in the American character, and of course we all know, you're, you know, Russia convert and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, America is a pretty good nation. People who came here had to fight their way through, had to work hard to become Americans. We have a spirit that's a very important. When tragedy happens around the world, who gets, who gets planes together? Who donates? Americans. When there's a disaster here or there, who goes helps out? We Americans do it. I'm not talking the politicians or the Masons or all these whatever. We go help people. We have it in our DNA. We do that for people. So that's why it was important to get after the United States. He said he would begin a campaign with the wisdom of a serpent. All right. I would whisper as I whispered to Eve, do as you please, do as you please. To the young, I would uh, whisper, the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what is bad is good and what is good is square. Does that sound like our uh, culture since the 60s, right? That sort of resonate. In the ears of young marriage, marriage, uh, marriage, married, sorry, I would whisper that work is debasing, not to be extreme in religion, in patriotism, in moral conduct. I would teach them to say, our father who art in Washington, you know, because the government's everything. If I were the devil, I would educate authors to make lurid literature so exciting, right? You, you the filth on television. I threaten TV with dirtier movies, and you know, with the stuff that's on television today, on pick any channel all over the place, you see stuff that they would go to jail for in the 60s. The worst smut pornography, and kids can turn any channel they want to. No wonders their heads are messed. These poor children, they're, these poor children, they don't have any structure. They don't have any, the, where's the church? It's all telling them everybody goes to heaven, do what you want. It's, it's pathetic. And he says further, I would, I would, uh, infiltrate unions and urge more loafing and less work because idle hands usually work for me. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could tell, whoever I could. I'd sell alcohol. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. Remember in the 70s, all those tranquilizers they were pushing, people were so screwed up, they didn't know heads were backwards, forwards. Well, take a tranquilizer. You'll feel better. You won't know what's going on. It happened. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects but neglect this to discipline emotions and let them run wild. I would designate an atheist to front me in the highest courts of the land. Does that sound about right? To rule in the Supreme Court, remember, good old Supreme Court, in favor of pornography, and evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, then from the houses of Congress, and then in his own churches. I would sub- substitute psychology for religion and deify science. If I were Satan, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I would take from those who have and I would give to those who want it until I kill the incentive of ambition. What's that? State ownership of everything. Communism, Marxism. Then I could separate families. My police state would force everybody back to work. And put, uh, so we'd put children in uniform or daycare centers from infancy, right? Just throw them in, throw them in a daycare center and put the objectors in slave camps. If I were Satan, I'd keep on doing what he was doing. Okay. So that's 1965. Even, I mean, these are people from the Protestant realm. In 1973, someone asked Billy Graham if the communists gave up their objectives and he said no. And a column he used to write before he got turned over to the other side. The Daily Worker in 1958, basically these were their objectives. To get control of the universe, universities, right? Did they get control of the universities? Check the box. To get, to eliminate laws governing obscenity by branding them as censorship and a violation of free speech. Did he do it? Done. To infiltrate the churches. Even Leo XIII warned about this in 1882. Is it done? Yes. To eliminate prayer or religious expression in school. Has it been done? 
Yes, and then they're bringing in the new prayer. Wait to see that in my talk. To discredit the family as an institution. Half the people out there, these young people don't even get married. They live together. When my daughter went to the biggest basilica in Buffalo with her fiancé, and the secretary's taking down information on them, and she was shocked that they didn't live in the same place. Well, they, she knew if she lived in the same place with her boyfriend, she wouldn't be in my house anymore. Uh, but that's what they expected. They expect that sort of thing. What is going on with our churches and our families? So these are the goals of the communists. Now, that being said, pass on. That's, I will be saying, okay, anybody ever hear Pat Buchanan? You know, Pat ran for the president. He was put down by somebody named Bob Dole, 33rd degree Mason. And the tide was turned. When I was working for Pat, and Pat, they turned the election around. He was winning in New Hampshire, winning in all the states, and all of a sudden, somebody who was very well rewarded by his fellow friends went and campaigned in the Carolinas. Pat stood for everything that the fundamentalist Protestants wanted. I mean, pro-life, uh, pro-marriage, pro-family. He was doing everything, but how did they turn the tide on him? They sent people in the Carolinas, one leader who's a Protestant, who basically said, you don't want the Catholics running the country. It's just like the Kennedys, you're going you're gonna to put the Pope in. So they turned the tide on Pat. But what did Pat know? What did, what did Pat know? If you didn't read this book right from the beginning... Those of you who were younger didn't live through what the church was before everything started changing. He, he was raised a Catholic in a good Catholic family. Interesting story. And he was our candidate, and he was right on all counts. So he wrote this book, which is right from the beginning. Here's a quote from that book. It's really neat. In those years, which is when he was growing up, the Catholic church was indeed mater et magestra, mother and teacher. As children, we took for granted what we had and often chased, chafed under the discipline and demands. We never doubted that not only did we live in the capital of the greatest nation in history, he lived in Washington, we belonged to the one true church. We were taught and believed that we were the fortunate ones, and the church indeed was a loving mother. When one had sinned, the confessional was there, waiting to restore God's grace. When we had personal problems or more often personal desires, we drove up on our bicycles and prayed for them. In solitude, you could explain the things silently and work things out. When Catholics drove past the front of the church, they made the sign of the cross in their cars. I, I, we had a druggist across the street. Every time we went past the church, he'd tip his head. Anybody remember those days? Are you old enough? That's what it was the church, right? We, it was It was everybody. And... There were no few pages of personal regret that when much of this was being thrown out like so much old furniture during the 1960s, some of us who should have been there were AWOL at the time, and that's Pat talking. When the communists celebrated May Day, he went, he was working in government, and he said they were, they, they were celebrating May Day like it was the greatest thing on earth. We didn't do that over here as a disgrace. Now they're telling children, and you hear this in your own families, we'll let the child decide what religion they want to be. And the children, the notion that children should decide for themselves what they should believe in was considered scandalous, if not laughable, in the early 60s, and the instructions of the truths of the faith were infinitely more important at his school, Blessed Sacrament, than learning the facts of mathematics, spelling, and geography. After all, that's why Catholic schools existed. That is why parents, priests, and nuns were making such immense personal sacrifices. Do you remember the, the nuns? They lived in a convent. They had their food, their housing, and that was it. I mean, this, there was no big salary there, and now they take over these schools and they have lay teachers. Well, of course, you're going to have to pay them, so they flushed out all the wreck, wreck the convents. I mean, who does that anymore? It's a terrible thing. But anyway, he says further, and this is why this book's so important. You get a real snapshot of what it was like to be a Catholic. Because saving one's soul was more important than saving one's life. The nuns did not wait till the upper grades to begin teaching right and wrong. If a child became a scientist or composer or scholar, it was ancillary to the central task of the parochial school, which was making good Catholics. That's what we were taught. Where do you see that anymore? This doesn't happen. Last thing, and again, this book is get it and read it. I mean, you have to see what, you know, that there was a whole Catholic culture. Your life on this earth, we were taught in the grade schools, as was I, was a time of testing. While God loved you and his only son had died on the cross for your sins, faith alone was insufficient for salvation. 
You had been baptized and confirmed in the true faith. You had been given a guardian angel to watch over you. You had penance in the Holy Eucharist to keep you in a state of grace. You had indulgences to be won and prescribed ways to win them, to wash away the consequences of past sin. But whether you went to purgatory or eventually to heaven or to hell for all eternity was up to you. That's what they taught us. It was up to you. To die in a state of mortal sin meant eternal damnation. There was no appeal from death from a death sentence of the soul, and there would be no one to blame but yourself. We lived in a world of clarity and absolutes. Men seek certitude. That's what the Catholic Church of the mid-century offered, and the modern church in America does not seem to understand. We had the way, the truth, and the light. Other ways were not equally valid. They were false. And as we were taught, those are false ways. While Catholicism made hard demands offered to those who kept the commandments of God and the commandments of the church, we had an ironclad guarantee, eternal life, eternal life. Going a little further. The true hunger that needs feeding is not physical. Fundamentalist and evangelical Protestant denominations whose preachers speak with conviction and authority of sin and salvation of hell and heaven. You see that, right? The fundamentalists, they'll talk heaven, hell, all that stuff. Today gather converts in what those who in 1950s would fight their way into the Catholic Church. You don't see that anymore because they don't talk about it anymore. At some Catholic parishes today, not in a month of Sundays, could you hear the subject of hell even mentioned. And sermons are all about being kind and considerate and nice. The church militant has been superseded by the church milk toast. While ch teenagers give themselves up to drug and despair, leading to appalling crime and violence in the inner cities and to indiscriminate sex, suicide pacts, and even satanic cults in the suburbs, the National Conference of Catholic Bishops labors away on pastoral letters to manifest the Catholic ch American Church's impatience with the most successful economy in history. That's what we have. It's a disgrace. It's an absolute disgrace. But you can read this. And this was, this was a guy who ran for president. That's why they had to smash him. That's why they smashed him. The media had to smash him. They had to get rid of him because that's where he came from. That's what he would bring to the White House. The Catholic Church in the 1950s was not taken from... This is Pat Buchanan now, just a civilian guy who worked for the government. The Catholic Church of the 1950s was not taken from without. It was surrendered from within. In the last quarter century, the Roman Catholic Church in the United States had been demystified as a prelude to establishment of the American Catholic Church. The holy sacrifice of the Mass, as prescribed by the Council of Trent, had been replaced by a communal meal celebrated in the vernacular. The Latin is gone. The sacred liturgy has been transformed. A banal English is the lingua franca of the new American church. Many of the new churches look on the inside like assembly halls, college classrooms, or off-Broadway theaters, right? That true? That's what you look at them. These new churches, they're all like stage shows, you know. Mass attendance is down. Vocations are down. The Catholic school enrollment is down. Conversions are down from the 50s. And the nuns who remain are unnecessary, acrimonious, and rebelling. They rebel, right? These modern nuns, you've seen them all. They rebel against the patriarchal Catholic church. Priests and theologians from Catholic campuses can be heard pontificating on the airwaves of contemptuous condescension of the orthodox pronouncements of our history in Rome. A quarter century after Vatican II, we need another Council of Trent. The old church, which was always there, unchanged and unchanging, seems to have disappeared outside a sign reads, open under new management. Right? Gone. Gone. So you should, you know, you should see this. And then he wrote another, he wrote lots of books. Death of the West, another book by Pat. If you haven't read that, he talks about other things which are really uh, quite important uh, here. Let me just get the next slide up. If you read the bottom of that print, I don't know if you can see it, how dying populations and immigrant invasions imperil our country and civilization, right? So the whole thing is we were losing our people. Why? You can't read that, but I'll read the top for you. Collapsing birth rates in the Western world. Europe will no longer be a, a Christian culture. You know it's been overcome. They can't reproduce. They're not reproducing enough. All right? By 2050, 2050, only one-tenth of the world's people will be of European descent, and it will be the oldest on earth. The median age will be almost 50. That's what's happening to our population. Is it an accident? No. 
America is losing its cultural war. Militant paganism is crowding the old fates. Separatism is triumphing over integration. The melting pot has become a salad bowl. An impact on American society, politics, and culture will be devastating. So, who we were, what we lost. We have the grace and power of a redeemed race and do nothing for the God who died to redeem us. Are we soldiers? Are we out there fighting? Is that what we're doing every day? We have tens of thousands of lost souls, lonely, sad, depressed young people. You see it in the paper every day. They have no anchor. They have no pole star. What can they look to? A church that has these fake old funerals that they say everybody went to heaven? You've, you've been to them, right? These modern funerals. Oh, they're in heaven now. Go pray to them. Yeah, right, fat chance. Uh, anyway, so we have... Many young people, their brothers, sisters, friends, husbands, and wives who should be here killed in abortion chambers. Think about them. See them. Now, you can't see this very well, but it says in 1975, the U.S. birth rate, one fertility rate was 1.8, 1 1.8 babies, right, per family. The next one, aging of Christian Europe. I put Christian in there. The total fertility rate of the European Union is 1.58 children per woman. In 2015. All right, here's the countries of the world if you can see them. Fertility rates in 2016 at the bottom, and most of the countries that you see are European countries, okay, is 0 to 0.99 children. We can't even replace ourselves. It's gone, and it's not an accident. The turtle, total fertility rate in the U.S. after World War II peaked at about, this is after the war, 3.8 children per woman in the late 1950s. And by, whoops, by 1999 was a two children. The fertility rate of U.S. population was below the replacement level of 1.9 children in 1979. So now the next thing, governments, why is this happening? You'll, you'll hear a little more about who, who did it, who was the, who pulled the trigger, but the plans were laid there a long time ago. Governments have often set population targets, either to increase or decrease the total fertility rate. That's all coming from the government. All these things, when you see this, this one thing that was a, a medical conference where the plans were laid out, they were going to pound this, uh, let's say, Conception rejecting stuff, abortion, all this stuff is not an accident. And they were pumping it through the medical profession. So you re and, and here in in these these are government documents. I don't know if you can see this, but it has uh, this this horrible Ceausescu. What a horrible thing he did. He was a horrible guy. But they they gave outlawed abortion, contraception, routine pregnancy tests, tax on childlessness, and illegal discrimination against childless people which resulted in a large number of people who couldn't raise them. I mean, this is a government agency condemning how dare they do this. The Chinese government sought to lower the fertility rate, as you know, right? There, oops, I go back twice. Uh, I really go back. Okay, so they had the one child per family. You know about that. And basically it says some governments have sought to regulate which groups in society could reproduce through eugenic policies of forced sterilizations and undesirable populations. In the law, there's a case called Buck versus Bell that went before the Supreme Court being run by 33rd degree Masons who were on the agenda said uh, that they sterilized a, a, a girl that was mildly retarded against her will because they said three generations of imbeciles is enough. And they do this in some of these group homes in, in Buffalo, New York. It's a disgrace. So demonic monsters are destroying our youth. What happened to our youth, especially young males? Do you notice the biggest victims are the young males? There's no jobs for young men. They're just not out there. They're just not out there. There's no opportunity. There's no church. There's no structure. So what is happening? There's loneliness. God intended so many children to be born, and they were not only destroyed by abortion, but Poisons and against the sins of life. Joe Scheidler calls them human pesticides. Get rid of children at all costs. Don't reproduce. It's a disease. You don't want children. People were going around in the 60s and 70s saying, I had my two because that's what they learned in Glamour magazine. You had two kids and out, so it was really sickening. Okay, so what do we have now? Vaccines, an epidemic of autism and allergies, heroin deaths, overwhelming. I don't know what it's like here, but I know what it's like back home, overwhelming. And kids from good families are on heroin and opioids. They dope themselves. They're so messed. It's unbelievable. Suicides, the suicide rate in this country is through the roof. Sadness and depression. 
many causes, mentally distraught because innocence was poisoned by perversion in media and filthy destruction of latency by government and schools, even churches. The church programs that I saw from Immaculate Conception School in East Aurora that a, par a parent brought me was so disgusting with their feeding children about what was normal would make you throw up, and that's 25 years ago. It would make you sick. So destroy love of parents, family, and country. Now, what else do we have here? Remember remember the marriage ceremonies? Those of you remember going to marriages and what, weddings when they were really sacred and breathtaking because, you know, when they walked down that aisle, that was a life commitment. It was not a feel-good commitment. And they said in there, in, in that beautiful nuptial mass, to, about the, the woman, faithful and chaste, let her marry in Christ. Let her ever follow the model of holy women. Let her be dear to her husband like Rachel, wise like Rebecca, long-lived like faithful Sarah. Let the authority of sin work none of its evil deeds within her. Let her keep the faith in the commandments. Let her be true to one wedlock and shun all sinful embraces. Let her strengthen, strengthen weakness by stern discipline. Let her be grave in demeanor, honorable for her modesty, and learned in heavenly doctrine and fruitful in children. And then it always ended, and I remember this. May they both see their children's children unto the third and fourth generation attaining old age, which they, that's how they blessed marriages back when. You, you don't see that anymore. So who do we have? I can tell you about our state, our, our warped state. And I don't know how that slide got turned sideways, but don't worry about it. Nelson Rockefeller, remember the Rockefeller family? You know, you know, all the big organizations they're part of and the banks they fund, et cetera. He was governor of New York from 1959 to 1973, 14 years, longest sitting governor of the state. His legacy, his legacy, they bragged about this. That newspaper article, if I had it turned right side up and you could read it, would say one of his highest legacies were basically producing the nation's first abortion rights bill. Isn't that wonderful? And how did Mr. Rockefeller die? In the arms of his 25-year-old aide, Megan Marshak. It was a very embarrassing story. He was found dead. He was, you know, because she had to wait to call because what they were doing was not exactly what they should have been doing. And his clothing was on in a reverse position. I will say no more, but draw your own conclusions. So among the fiascos he did was Diego Rivera. There was a mural at the Rockefeller Center which was praising Lenin, and they had to take it down because it was so obviously pro-communist and Marxist. And also, he had a high-profile divorce from Mary Clark, his wife of 22 years, and then he took up with Margareta Happy Murphy. Her name was Happy. Happy Rockefeller, who was the wife, his wife at the time of death, but of course he wasn't with his wife at the time of his death, so he gave us abortion. So New York State at that time became the abortion capital of the world. And I'm saying this for my state, because that's what I know, but you know what is all over the country? But New York led the charge. We have never in New York abandoned this fight, okay? We are in a war. It's a battle over our nation and our world. So you're active, missing in action, or AWOL. So what does the creed say? Well, you know what the creed says? I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life. Where does life come from? The Holy Ghost. You know how it, how it says that the unforgivable sin, I, I ponder this because I'm, no, I'm not one of these fancy theologians or dissertation people or anything like that, but it's, it, it, what's a sin against the Holy Ghost? If he's the Lord, the giver of life, rejecting life. There's a lot of people should be walking around a lot in sackcloth and ashes before their final number comes up because that's pretty serious stuff. Therefore, there's another quote in the Missal. I didn't pull out the source, but trust me, it's in there. Therefore, I have saved your hand to you because you fought the battles of the Lord. There are many of us fighting this. And you know what? My husband was editorial page editor in a newspaper that darn near killed him, eventually owned by Warren Buffett, and he fought this fought, fight every day, but... He came across something in the, in the, in the depths of something that came across, and it was one of these things that they put around in their liberal craziness. And you know what it said? It said, we thought we'd win the abortion war, but we didn't. This is coming from the other side, because people like us were out there fighting, saying you're not going to murder children. So it meant something. This kind of activity means something. So here's another article. Those of you who are French, anybody French, French here, French Canadian, read, you know, can you read French? It says something. Margaret Sanger, okay, or the Devil's Cauldron. You know who she was. She was Miss Planned Parenthood. She's probably, and this is what they, this is translated. I translated it for you because I don't speak French either. And this is characterized by a French writer. She is probably the greatest monster in the history of humanity. This American woman, imbued with Malthusian, Malthusian theories, considered that blacks were a sub-race and were to be neutralized. She's a good friend of Adolf Hitler. She pronounced her massive sterilization in the name of racial purity. 
She was awarded by the Ku Klux Klan. She hated humanity and had Darwinian theories and, and, and thought we should eliminate the weakest. A really sick puppy. I should, worse than that, but okay. 60 million human beings have been murdered in their mother's wombs. How did this happen? Okay. We believe soldiers of Christ, soldiers, raise your hand. Life comes from God, right? Our nation, world, and culture used to cherish life. We do anything to protect little children. What happened? How did this culture get more turned upside down than it ever was? Before the 1960s, abortion, anti-conception, deviant living were crimes punishable by law. Did you know that? And some people say, well, I'm in a common law marriage. Guess what? They don't even have that in New York State. No such thing. So before the 60s, abortion was illegal. Contraceptives were illegal. The guy who ran the law school before I got there, Larry, Sh Larry Schwartz, I forget his name, but apparently he was a lead attorney on Griswold versus Connecticut, which is a Supreme Court case that challenged this. So we got to be able to sell this stuff because who wants kids? How did this radical shift take place? How did it take place? Okay, abortion rights. Now, how did this sneak in? How did it sneak in? Lyndon Baines Johnson, the war on poverty, right? The Great Society. Okay, title, titles 18, 19, and 20. That was, they called it family planning. It was to plan your families, you know, because God can't plan them for you. You gotta plan them yourself because you're so much smarter than God. And isn't that the initial sin of pride? I know better than you because I'm smart and you're dumb. I just gotta tell you how it is. So I have an article here and I will show it to you. I have a few of them. This was a conference, a conference that took place for pediatricians in 1969. A doctor, a Dunnegy, went there, and it was a, it was like one of these professional things. You go, they teach you new stuff about law if you're a lawyer, medicine if you're a doctor. So they had this conference, and they had a speaker who eventually went to work for the um, Alan Guttmacher Planned Parenthood Institute. Okay, and that was that was basically this great thing. So basically, uh, this doctor Dunnegan went to this lecture by a doctor Day, and doctor Day. It was the end of the conference. They had, had been all playing golf and learning a few things here and there and writing off the whole conference. And then at the end of it, they had a big conference in a big room, fancy wancy, drink all you want, eat all you want, fancy meals, but they closed the doors. And they said, you're not allowed to tape record this. Remember, 1969, you're not allowed to write down notes. You're not allowed to make any recordings. Why? We're going to tell you stuff that you won't believe coming in the coming 40 years that are our plans. They're in place. They're going forward with military precision, and there's nothing anybody can do to stop them. But we haven't kept it secret. It's just people are too dumb to look because they don't read enough, and they don't, they don't investigate enough. So everything they said here, including if you think the churches will oppose our plans, you are wrong. They will support us. I have a few transcripts of that talk. It's online. I strongly recommend that you get your hands on it. As I said, I only brought a few. I promised one to Dennis. Dennis, you're here somewhere with Dennis. Hi. Okay. I said you can have one, uh, but I have a few. You can get it online. I brought some envelopes for the Blessed Mother's House, the crisis pregnancy place that we run in Buffalo. I'll give you an envelope. You can write to me, and I'll send it to you for cost of mailing because we had to have these reproduced. You can get it online, though, and save yourself the, the postage stamp and remembering to do it. Read this. Everything is in there. They were going to change how people dress. They were going to change sports. They were going to change, uh, I guess, perceptions of who can do what. They basically got into, into base. They're going to, uh, promote football because we need violence, but put down baseball. All these crazy things. They, they, there was nothing they didn't cover in their future plans, and it reads like a script for today. You might want to read this. If you haven't seen it or you haven't found it by now, you're not paying attention, and you should. Okay, so here's family planning, Title 19, and what they call the Women's Health Program. You've seen all they always, these, these feminines, feminazis go out there and they say, we speak for women. You're not speaking for me. But just because you say you're speaking for women doesn't mean you speak for women, but the media who's all on their side is going to say that they're speaking for women. Well, wrong. And if we don't open our mouths and talk, we let them get away with it. You can't let them. you got to speak up. Open your mouth and talk. We're all mute and deaf, dumb, and blind. you got to speak out against this stuff. So look at the new order of barbarians, okay? What they called it was sex without reproduction and reproduction without sex. I personally was involved in a case, and I'll deviate for a minute. Here comes this deep throat from a group home where they had these retarded people, right? Retarded girl, and she was mildly retarded, and she's pregnant. So <clears throat> somebody inside the agency called off the record and said they're, they're, they tried to force her into an abortion. She's five months pregnant. Can you help her? So my late law partner and I get up. And we met with her and we said, they can't force you. You know, it's a right of choice. They can't make you have an abortion. She's five months pregnant. She jumped off the table or something. So they couldn't get her to go ahead with it. So 
we met with her, and then we had to meet with her again to protect her rights. Well, by the time that we went back to see her, they found out we were trying to get into the group home, and what they did was they wouldn't let us come in. They said, you're forbidden. So we went to court, and we got a court order to go see this girl who was pregnant. And so well, by the time we got to the group home, they put her in this filthy front room, reception room of this group home in Buffalo on Linwood Avenue, and Joe and I went in there, and she was doped so bad, she was curled up in fetal position saying, I want to see those people, I want to see those lawyers, and so, so they doped her. So we went to court anyway before the judge, because there was a hearing on getting her ab- aborted with this wonderful big law firm. So the judge, we told the judge, well, she's telling us she doesn't want us. We, sh- we should have said that they, she had been doped. When they brought her to court, she looked just like anybody here. She was just mildly retarded, but she dressed as nice as anybody in this room. When they brought her to court, they had her dressed up like a slob. They had her, her slip hanging out of her skirt. They made her look like a real wreck. And we went and we had, for, for her to have this baby, there were a bunch of really good nuns that would teach retarded people who, you know, mildly retarded about giving birth. We had an open adoption where a couple would have adopted. She could have come to see this baby anytime, been mama too. And we go to court and we said to the judge, well, I don't know, but we'll be here. He says, you can be amicus curiae. And we argued that they didn't have a right to force her into an abortion and they didn't because she didn't have, you know, she was an adult. They brought in her mother, who was slatternly. This woman was just a real piece of work. She And she got on the stand, and she said, well, I don't know how she can have babies. She can't take care of us. It's disgusting. But the judge ruled in our favor. He said, you don't have a right to force her into an abortion. So court is over. I find out a month and a half later from our source inside the agency that they, regardless that she wasn't the... She was not the uh, guardian of, of this girl. They got her appointed somehow, and they aborted her against her will seven months pregnant and then sterilized her and New York State's policy in group homes is they give them sex playrooms they can have as much sex as they want but they can't have children welcome to the dirty world all right so what's what's next here's this other one here's more about uh, Margaret Sanger called by H.G. Wells basically the greatest woman in the world That's H.G. Wells, and you read about him. Here she is again with the Ku Klux Klan getting her award, but you won't hear about that in the the general media. She was awarded by, she was a friend of Hitler. She was awarded by the Ku Klux Klan. She wanted to lead to a cleaner race. Their big quote, which you can see online over there, if I can show it to you. The largest thing, uh, the best thing, the most merciful thing a large family can do to one of its infant members is to kill it. When Lyndon Johnson's Title 18, 19, and 20 were passed through the Congress as part of his great society, Planned Parenthood, which is this little not-for-profit rotten organization, became the biggest abortion provider in the country. So far, last time I looked, $25 billion of money went into it, and in the state of California, they had Planned Parenthood researched by a pro-life couple that went in and they were offering to sell baby parts, you name it, kidneys, lungs, liver, whatever you want. And this, the, these pro-lifers were able to go in and act as if they wanted to buy this. They did a great job, but then they were indicted by the California Attorney General who has been supported by Planned Parenthood in one of his election campaigns, I understand. And so they were showing pieces of babies they actually had a, a older aborted baby there, and they were lifting up pieces, this heart and kidneys, and they sell this stuff. And yet, they're not in jail, but they'd like to jail all the pro-lifers. Okay, an active worker, um, worker for the Socialist Party. She had all these rotten friends, but he, this was her phrase, no gods, no masters. Then she died in uh, 19, 82 years old, and they hailed her in the New York Times because she led about birth control. She was an active worker for the Socialist Party. That's what you got. But then you see things here, and you'll never see them in the mainstream media. 24-year-old woman died after an abortion. Okay, Planned Parenthood. They sell baby parts, and they laugh about it. If you go online, I think we had it at Buffalo Regional Right to Life Committee, that clip from those people that were selling baby parts. They actually show them showing the parts and laughing about it. It's grotesque. So you hear in the Fatima, the whole Fatima story and and the whole Fatima reality about the annihilation of nations. Well, how are nations annihilated? By loss of people, loss of national identity, genocide. Catholic Africa is undergoing genocide. They've been undergoing genocide for how how many decades now? They're killing Christians in Africa wholesale. 
I had a, I had another slide, but I took it out because I figured I don't know what kind of kids would be here. But they show a bunch of these um, the, these jihadists uh, have uh, these two guys, three guys, chained in these orange suit, and how they and they put it on TV and or on the internet how they chop the heads off. They're proud of it. So this Al Shabab's demented beheadings of killing Christians were nine thousand. This, this was this was a long time ago, but it, that was posted six days ago. It was an older site. Islamic terrorist group Al Shabab's beheadings and attacks against Christians will continue to rise, with the Somali-based militants having an estimate estimated nine thousand jihadis at their disposal, and that was a while ago. Okay, how do you annihilate nations? Well, it's happening. Brutal beheadings and murders. They were bragged about and broadcast all over the world. The Obama administration said nothing. Remember that? Said nothing. Uh, Donald Trump says it says one thing, and they want to crucify him. And Obama's sitting there, and they're showing on the internet, slicing the heads off people and journalists. And there's silence in the White House, and that's good with the with the mainstream media. A priest, remember the priest was murdered at the altar in Brittany, and what we get from the Vatican? We'll keep him in our prayers. Okay, so they're going to pray about this. Young schoolgirls are captured, made into prostitutes. So we've got this phony United Nations. So what about crime? That's those aren't crimes against humanity. And they're sitting there with some tin horn leader who's running the whole place, and they're doing nothing. Of course, of course, nothing. So we have to see not only in the carnage, but in our dead fellow Americans' lives that would fill their would have filled our neighborhoods, cities, and schools. You know, we're depopulated. We are depopulated. They have smashed our population. So some lies. We are not a culture of life. We are a culture of death. It's a fraud on the people to have events that celebrate life. You see them all over the place. We're good people, and we celebrate life, and we won't protest too much. Oh, really? So we, we should be mourning the dead, repenting for our inaction, and there should be 24-7 protests from day one. The, the Father Srenovich, I think, said, you have to oppose evil where you see it. He said that in a sermon this morning at this... I don't know, 7.30, whatever mass it was, that was when I was at, whatever time it was. And that's what he said. Well, what are we doing about this? There should be basically 24-7 protests, but this happy stuff has kept the public and the church people deluded. Okay, what do we see? Abortion kills children. They will die without our help. That's a fact. There you go. That's a 10-week aborted fetus, little hand, right? The little baby hand. I don't know if you can see that. Abortion is child sacrifice. I mean, there are mothers who come out publicly in all these these marches saying, I have to, this is my right, it's a right to choose. I'm a Catholic, but I should have the right to choose and do this and do that because my career is more important. I will have my children killed so I can have a career, really. That's what we have out there. It's pretty sick. So this is a first trimester, six to ten week Abortion, see the little heart, the little hands. Second trimester, 15 weeks, that's what it looks like. We, we show these at the March for Life. It's grotesque. And it is, basically, it's diabolical. Like Baal, child sacrifice. This one didn't come out too good, so we'll skip that one. It's upside down or something. But anyway, you get the idea. A little When you see this thing on video, it's, I, I, you can go on the website. It actually has the sound of a child. You know, did you ever see a, a kid, the baby crying in terror, and mother walks away or something? Baby gets, you know, goes to the doctor, doesn't like what they're doing. Did you ever you know how a kid cries in terror? Baby, the scream. Can you imagine the scream from a child being sliced up in the womb of its mother? Can you even imagine that? It's grotesque. Here's another one. I'm sorry these didn't reproduce that well, but they're they're bad. There you go. That's what you're looking at. And these are, these are not, when you see, see here's 60 million abortions, you know what? Here, These are human beings, you know what I'm saying? Look at that. Look at that poor, look at this poor little kid. It's just, it, it's it's grotesque. But you have to think about these people as people because as statistics, that's what they say, they show a dog on television and everybody will go donate money to save the little doggy or the little kitty cat that got, you know, its tail run over by a car. But these ba babies are murdered in the womb and we're not supposed to say anything. So we have been unable to stop the brutal murders, lost lives that are just like the ones in these pictures. I'm back one. I don't know where I lost the slide here, but that's okay. All right. So we haven't stopped them. And John Hancock, there's a quote from John Hancock. He deliberately signed his name so large that his friend, the king, could see his signature. We learned that back when I used to teach history. Remember John Hancock? They always talk about John Hancock. He wrote big so he could see it. 
When was the last time you, I hear people that I can't write a letter because they'll pick on my children and I'm afraid, people are just wussy girls. I mean, just so, they don't want to do anything. But how many people are fearful of signing their name to a letter even protesting abortion? Okay, what has happened? What saves souls Catholic schools? This is the school that I, I basically went to. It was next door to the Blessed Mother's house. We ended up with a better bishop buying uh, the convent of my youth from these, that these it was a beautiful place. It's 10,000 square feet. We bought it from nickel and dime donations that people did. We helped women have their babies. We've, get, we've saved kids' lives with a lousy refrigerator, a stupid refrigerator. Mother call up, I can't have another baby. My refrigerator's broken, this and that. And we get some guys out there, and they take a refrigerator. We furnish it. I mean, it's, it's practical stuff. You, there are kids alive because of dumb things that we have done because we care. So that was the school. This is what it looked like right when they were thinking about blowing it down. They closed it for nothing. It's sad. So, all right. So, what are we looking at? We live in a world gone rotten. Atheism is the religion of the day, is it not? It's atheism, isn't that the public religion? We live in socialism. Everything we do has have, has the government in it. Those chairs you're sitting on, government regulated. The you know the the everything to do with this place over here has government. Everything you do has a tax, a charge, a regulation, what have you. Tens of thousands of churches have been shut down. As many Catholic schools have been closed. The evident and that's the kind of Catholic school we used to have. Remember when what Pat Buchanan wrote about the way, the truth, the light? They're all gone. They're just all gone. So we have this dumb education system which is barbaric and a mask for vapidity where students learn nothing in school. You know they don't learn anything in the mainstream schools except maybe propaganda, Very learn very little. So children's innocence is destroyed in early childhood. It's not an accident while mothers willingly commit them to others in infancy when these poor tots don't even have the security of house and home and were tossed into the cares of strength. Can you imagine taking a little six, you know, six-week-old infant and turning them into a daycare center so somebody else can teach them their first word? or walk, watch them walk their first step, they'd done all the time. They'd proliferated. That's what they do with children now. So even, and I know this from people that also work in my office, daycare centers are absolutely forbidden to use the word Christmas because Christian. They can't celebrate Easter. They can have spring vacation because it's Christian, the symbols of our holidays. Young men are committing Suicides like epidemic, epidemics, heroin um, and opioids take lives of precious lives every day, every day. Kids are lonely. Families are falling apart. Divorce is rampant. We've rejected family life and children. Immorality is the, is the story of the day. In the 60s, like a bomb went off, right? It's like a bomb went off. Everything changed. Is this an accident? No, no, no. It's not an accident. Are they the heirs of Russia? Yes. Communism and atheism. What did the Blessed Mother say when you have even people like Billy Graham and Paul Harvey talking about it? You know that it's the, that the cancer is spread all over the, the entire nation. So it's been accomplished. A Scottish Rite magazine in the 1970s, there's a quote. Scottish Rite, you know what that is? That's the Freemasonry magazine. There's a quote. If the crazies, meaning us, did more reading, they would realize that they have lost. That's what they said right there in their magazine. The crazies, us, have realized we have lost, and that's 1970s. But why did this happen? Why did all this stuff happen? It's a textbook answer. The secret was not revealed. Russia was not consecrated. They threw away everything. I mean, it's just basically they threw out the whole church. What the, as Pat Buchanan said, the church is gone. But why, why, why? So for us soldiers, we're only privates, maybe first class, maybe third class, maybe no class, but we're soldiers of Christ over here, okay? So skip the bishops, and never mind the big stuff. I mean, we go, we talk about the big stuff happening. The big stuff will not happen until the little stuff happens. In other words, you know, when it tells you, when you read your New Testament, which you should do every day, the epistles, it says, you know, you have to bless those who curse you. I mean, it's hard to do that stuff. Somebody beats you up or hurts your kid or, or maligns you. It's hard, but that's living the gospel and then doing the work and stopping evil every time. And if we rose up, Pope Leo or some the Pope Benedict, one of the popes said, if I had an army of Catholics saying the rosary every day in force, I could change the world. But we don't. May, you know, there's a few of you here, but we don't. Where's everybody else? Where are they going? I mean, what's what's happening? So, we 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 went through the the numbers of all of us. We we are all soldiers in the army. So they took these schools. Okay, what's the object of God's army? What's the object? 
Save souls. Save souls. And you get, I, I hate to say it, there's all this squawking and awking and cater walling and all these different groups and traditional, but, but you know, the whole thing is somebody said, well, I'm perfect because I have this and I, you know, sing in the choir, blah, 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 blah. No. No, you're on active duty 24-7. When you're in the Army, you're not off the Army. You're in the Army. So missing in action, AWOL, are you? We have 60 million butchered babies, 450 million con- con- conceptions rejected by abortifacients, human pesticides. Schools are filled with intentional idiotic exercises and non-education and indoctrination against our beloved nation. Sexualization has killed romance. Did you ever notice? I mean, it, you know, ba- way back. I mean, there's, you know, like you could hear songs and there were these nice songs about, you know, falling in love. You don't hear that anymore. When somebody's dating somebody, you know what that means, and it doesn't mean going to the soda bar and having a soda with them, something. It's bad business out there. Drugs, heroin, opioids, loneliness, barbarian conduct, rejection of parents, divorce, daycare. In the Soviet Union, when they started daycare, they had to do it at the point of a gun. I have pictures. They took the kids from those old Russian ladies at the point of a gun, young Russian ladies, because they knew enough not to turn their kids over to the daycare center of the state, and in this country, we throw them in on purpose. Okay, the systems twist people's identity. You know that um, the uh, all the plastics that you drink out of waters, they have endocrine disruptors. You know that. And there's these big cycles in both oceans, maybe a couple of them, that swirl around with all this plastics. Well, what's in the plastic are endocrine disruptors. That means they change your, your, your hormones. They do that. It's a fact. It's happening. It's happening. They're fishing the ocean and fishing lakes that can't reproduce because they're, 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 they're shims. They're not him. They're not her. They're not anything. And we can't even, you know, and God's going to fix us. You think it's going to come with a bomb. It's going to come from everywhere. You won't, it, everything's changing so fast and so bad. You won't know where it's coming from. My people at the beginning are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Who speaks up? I mean, these darn uh, twisted newspapers. You know, my husband worked there. He said, if your, your side doesn't speak up. I mean, I always spoke up and then I got called crazy, you know, every God knows under the sun, but I mean, always coming out front. But who speaks up? You got to open your mouth. Even if you're talking to the maniacs, you got to speak up, do something. Okay. Back when, when sex education was coming, we had a cadre of women. We would go, we'd put on our coats and hats and go charging the schools and charging these. And we changed things. We held things off. We made a difference. I don't care what they called us, but we did something. So we have, basically are like sheep, you know, that we like sheep in the hallelujah chorus. We like sheep have gone astray, everyone to our own way. You know, the hell, you know, the, the Messiah handles Messiah. So he says, we're like sheep. We got, we've gone astray. That's where we're at. So here's this beautiful school. They couldn't wait to close it fast enough from the diocese. But what are we about? Okay, there's what we're, we are about, the heart and love of the crucifix. And this is what we lost. So, you know, everybody thinks... Everybody thinks, you know, when you see the abortion pictures, it's, it, it stops your heart. It's horrible. But you can't imagine 60 million missing Americans who would have had kids by now. We're wondering where our population went. Guess what? Guess what all that contraceptive Margaret Sanger stuff that the doctors pumped into all their offices went? We don't have kids. So this is what we lost. We're not just those babies, but look at what we would have had. Look at these beautiful pictures. I mean, look at these kids. You got to think of them this way. You have to think of them as real people. You know, kids getting married, sharing beautiful, you know, beautiful times of life. That's what we lost. You got to think of them as these kinds of people. We have lost them. They're gone. Taking care of the old people, loving, you know, loving one another. It's gone. The graduation day, the joy and happiness. These are what was lost in the buckets of those abortion clinics and those damnable pills that Margaret Sanger couldn't peddle fast enough with doctors who were dedicated to be doctors and take care of us, and instead they wanted to give out their garbage so we couldn't have children. Look at this, the little kids, the little raincoat. That's what's missing. Look at this, all that, those happy times, it's gone. Those are the 60 million. They're not just bucket, you know, disasters. They're lives we needed and we don't have anymore. It's, it's a disgrace. Look at that little kid and the little doggy and all these little things. That's what's missing. 60 million. Can you imagine 60 million human beings like that are gone? So let's not, Think of them and mourn for them, and we have to recognize who these kids were. Our brothers, our sisters, our children, our friends who might have married our kids and raised our children with them. Maybe kids are so lonely and on dope and heroin because they never found the love of their life. What's a lonely child who can't find their mate in life? They can't relate. There's nobody. You've seen loneliness in young people, right? The 20s, the 30s. You've seen the heartbreaking loneliness of young people. It's enough to rip the guts out of you if you're paying any attention. They were 
already, okay? Whatever became of our loving hearts for children, where were the doctors to shout this horror out? They just all got strung along and trained and told it's going to come and you can't stop it, so you can't do anything. So by the time abortion was the law of the land, mass birth control, deviant sex was is in the coming age of barbarianism, and we presented on this long, long ago. But the nation slept, and it was about population control. If you read Randy Engel's stuff, population control, depopulation. They have to get rid of us, especially us pain-in-the-neck Americans. So we should think of them, mourn for them, and repent for them. This country should be full of sackcloth and ashes of people repenting for these horrible sins. And look at what it looks like. That's what happens with loss. That's what happens when people die. And those people died. 60 million, okay? Look at this. I mean, just look at that, the, the terror, the funeral, look at these things, the kids in war. That's what we've lost. These are people we've lost. They're not statistics. We've lost, have we lost our ability to take pity on the loss of life? Every life is from the hand of God, and we have literally slapped God in the face and said, we don't want your gift of a child. We don't want your gift. The best thing you can give us is a kid, and we don't want them. Because we have been sangarized. We have been Title 18, 19, and 20. We let our kids get corrupted in these filthy schools where they've been teaching them sex from early ages and destroying their latency periods. Where are we? A Chesterton quote, Courage is almost a contradiction in terms. It means a strong desire to live taking the form of readiness to die. Look at this. Look at this. And here are people, basically, casualties of war. But there would have been other, maybe there wouldn't have been these wars if we had all these people. Where are they? Shouldn't we weep? Should we not make this war on our own soil, our, on our own soil, our daily work, our daily crusade? Look at this. Look at what we've lost. Look at what it's like to lose life. Mourn for these children. The shocking loss of life and hopelessness. Now, this is the wrong slide, but I'm going to tell you what's on it. Okay. 42,773 42, people died from suicide in 2014. Can you imagine that? When I was growing up, if you heard of a suicide, it would stop your breath. 42,773 suicides compared with 29,199 in 1999, 112 per day. People taking their own lives because our, our culture is so shot. Men die by suicides 3.5 times more than women. Why? Because men have the burden. Because when that whole no child philosophy takes over, it puts, a, you know, puts women in the driver's seat and the men are just crushed. They don't know what they're doing, but they've got to get on their horse and ride and take back the family. They have to do this. White males accounted for seven of ten suicides in 2015. White males are men committing suicide. Can you imagine? In 2015, the U.S. highest U.S. Suicide, US suicide rate, 15.1 among whites. Okay, Jesus walked the earth. And so many times it says in Scripture, he took pity on the crowd, right? How many times you see that? He took pity on the crowd. He took pity on an adulteress. He took pity on the ten lepers. And he looked with pity on the hungry crowds, those little needs that Christ took. How much pity do we show or have we given or have we considered unthinkable in the loss of life in our own country? Or is this just what some have made it, a rhetorical debate about imaginary figures? Our silence in the face of evil condemns us. We are like sheep led to slaughter. Confession faded from the church. Sunday mass, look at the declining numbers. Churches are now mosques and performance halls. And right next to our blessed mother's house, they took this church and turned it into a warehouse and a workshop. Who called foul? Just a few of us. Who, were we taken blind to see what was happening? Didn't we know our faith was enough to m motivate us to shout file and foul and go after the perpetrators? Again, Hancock signs his name. Abortion was legalized. What do we do? I mean, what happens in our country? In Buffalo, New York, 10,000 people from the Buffalo area, including a lot of Catholics, marched in a gay parade. Judges, judges, politicians, clubs, priests, nuns, and but those who claim to be pro-life, you can barely get them going today anymore because those charged with representing us, they don't even want to send a postcard or a card. Okay, millions killed in the womb, nobody wants to do it. But anyway, what can we do? You shouldn't have an idle moment, as St. Paul says, pray always to bring our nation to repentance. But when was the last time you personally called a bishop? You may not go to the diocesan church, but when was the last time you got him on the phone and said, you know, I'm not going to your churches anymore because this is what you do. Anybody ever do that here? Give them a call. Are you afraid to? Because they might, you know, cuss out your kids. And somebody's raising their hand. Why not? 
And today, we don't have to, we don't have to do the things they used to have to do in the old days and get, com- you know, complicated. You call on the telephone. Send them a letter. If you're such a chicken, don't sign your name. Say, I'm not signing my name because you're going to get even with my kids. But they're, they're closing schools and churches and selling them to, to uh, pagan religions, and we're all standing by and saying nothing. So we can call a member. We can go home from this thing armed with rosaries, pamphlets, and keep them on, on hand to evangelize. Do you know how many lonely souls are abandoned in nursing homes and have no one to talk to? I mean, you go to these places, there's nobody to talk to these people. They're just sitting there in these lousy beds and getting wheeled around and placed in front of a television uh, set so they can be zoned out because there's nobody to talk to them. How many of these people who took their own lives might not have taken them if somebody cared about them? There are tons of drugs, but you don't see the dealers rounded up. The country's not rounding them up, but the government just comes up another program. So where is the church and what are we doing for this national tragedy? Did you ever think to call and ask them? So what can you do? Organize a rosary rally, get photos of a baby killing, Call into the talk shows. Call out cancer. So, you know, gotta pray. Pray those rosaries. Think. Live your religion. But, okay, have a rosary hang on your rear view mirror. Some priest that I had, he made some sarcastic comment because I always hung a plastic rosary on my rear view mirror. So, oh, I said, rosaries on the rear view mirror. And I said, yeah, I got about a hundred rosaries and I'm proclaiming my faith by putting that rosary up there on my rear view mirror because it says Catholic, right? So what, you don't have 10,000 rosaries? Everybody's giving them to you over at things like this. Hang it up. Say, I'm a Catholic. Okay. Most religious orders, okay, in Blessed Sacrament, find a church, pray before the Blessed Sacrament. It will invigorate you. Most religious orders were started by lay people. Did you know that? Most religious orders were started by lay people, right? And just think about the lonely, dejected young people that are killing themselves. Why isn't there an order devoted to saving these kids? The Protestants run this stuff. Why aren't we? What about an order of sisters to repent of the sins against life in the flesh when so many go to hell? Maybe, a, maybe somebody's called to open a, you know, start being that first nun and call women together to repent. Do nothing but repent. Mail out literature, hand out literature. We did this at the March for Life. This was, we held up the sign. Do your duty, admonish the sinner, and that was the Catholic abortion politicians in New York, and, and not New York, Joe Biden, Andrew Cuomo, Kathy Hochul, Brian Higgins, Kirsten Gillibrand, Tim Kent, they're all, they're all pro-abortion. So here's our little, uh, I, I don't have good pictures, but it's, and I don't know why, why they're just doing this, but I'm not going to turn it. We have a nice statue of the Blessed Mother there. Here's people at the March for Life, right? And, and, and the March for Life isn't the be-all and end-all. It's not enough to just go walk to, down the streets, but you got to do something. But it says here, they will die without your help. Okay, assisted suicide is on the march. You get a fight, you know they're making assisted suicide the law. Strange, New York, the court of appeals, the highest court in the state, actually ruled against assisted suicide. That decision came out. But Andrew Cuomo, son of Mario Abortion Cuomo, all right, who's now the governor, lives with his lady friend in the governor's mansion. He's He wants that passed. He's going to get elected in spades because he owns the state pretty much. However, what's going to happen is he's going to make the legislator pass it, and he, fearing Mr. Trump's talk about putting pro-life judges on the Supreme Court, is has his law ready to go in New York State to make abortion a constitutional right in the state of New York. Ready to go, and he will get his lackeys to pass it. That's going to happen. So in Washington, D.C., they have a bill that will enable a person to see their doctor and get a pill that will have them dead in three hours. So somebody's down and out and depressed, they're going to go see their doctor, and I want to kill myself. The doctor, by law, will have to give them a pill. It will go home, take the pill, in three hours, you're dead. That's, that's, that's a proposed law. That's not an exaggeration. See films on organ donation. Do you know that if you sign organ donation on some of your licenses, it's probably irrevocable? And we have to fight that because they, they get these young kids and the young kids will say, well, I'm dead anyway. So why can't somebody have my organs, right? Wrong. Wrong. If you re- watch the Paul Byrne film, and, and he spoke at one of uh, Father Gruner's conferences, we, we did this for a youth conference and we gave them the kids. Basically, you have to be alive to donate your organs. Do you know that? They can't take organs out of a dead body, but they cannibalize people and they have organ harvesters to go grab the bodies. You can, I have samples of these. I didn't bring, you know, tons to give you, but I have samples of these. If you want to go back to your pro-life organization, uh, you can, you can do this. Who's stopping you? Pay for it. Go to the printer. Get something made. Educate the kids. Do something. Don't sit on your, you know, on your behinds and, 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 and bemoan how rotten everything is. It's rotten. I guarantee you. So, 
when you stand before God in the final judgment, he'll say, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you give me something to drink? When I was butchered in my mother's womb, where were you? Can you think a moment for a minute that God will not ask why 60 million of our countrymen were murdered in their mother's wombs? What did you do about it? And you can say, well, like a lot of people, I'm pro-life. Well, what do you think that will buy you in eternity? And here is here is agony. That's what death looks like. We don't see those aborted babies, but that's the way we should be looking at them. Terrible and tragedy. So what happened in the church? We put the tabernacle to bat. That's St. Saint, Saint Martin's Church in Buffalo, New York. They have the seats all facing the front. They stuck the tabernacle in the back. And here's what they did to my school because the Blessed Mother's house, the old convent next door, we they, there was word Stacy was going to open another school, which we did run a real good Catholic school for 13 years in the, out in uh, the country where I am. That word came out, the diocese spent half a million dollars to take down that school, and there you see the cross that was in that window knocked out and demolished. That's what they did. That's what it looked like. Catholic bishops, parochial schools used to be the way in Buffalo, a very Catholic area. In 1932, toward Soviet America by William Z. Foster, head of the Communist Party in the USA, indicated that a national department of education would be one of the means to develop a new socialist society in the U.S., and we don't have the kind of Catholic schools that Pat Buchanan went to to teach the kids. And what's stopping you? I knew nothing about running a school. I, we opened a school in Derby. We had, was ran it for 13 years till the priest order decided to leave town and give up, and they went. But we did this. You can. There's nothing you can't do. I once had a. I went to a mass at a tr- local traditional church because there was a mass on a Monday morning. I was oh man, I can go to mass on Monday mornings. You you know get a good mass. And I went in there, and I didn't never saw this priest in my life as long as I lived. But the 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 manager of this parish, who's a female, very she just loves everybody, and she just doesn't like any competition. I mean, I I wanted, I was going to start a school for them, you know, horrible monster that I am, and word got out, but I'm, I'm sitting there in church and, you know, trying to say my prayers, and the priest gives up and gives a little sermon. He says, just be, I mean, I never met him. I know who this priest was, never saw him in my life. And he's over there saying blah, 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 a little sermon, and he says, just because you think you're a lawyer doesn't mean you can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, thank you very much. It's always good to get slapped around, but you know, I I can't do anything. I'm a, I'm a sinner like everybody else. I can't do anything, but Scripture tells me, and we're supposed to be soldiers of Christ, and those are walking with us. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. You can do all things, and you can do what you need to do because Christ will give you the strength no matter what you know or what you can't do. You can do it, so don't buy the lies of the devil that you're helpless. Here's another. This this is another nasty thing. Here's that church, that little church I went to, one of the poorest ones. You see ones that are like cathedrals that are now apartment buildings and shopping centers and everything else. I mean, 100 churches of the most Catholic area in New York State, gone. I, I didn't have a chance to reproduce this, but here is this beautiful, I'll show it to you if you want to come up and look after I'm talking. Here's this beautiful Beautiful, beautiful church in uh, this. In, I don't know. It's in Italy, okay. And best known for converting a medieval castle. Uh, no, that's not the one. It's, it's it's basically a medieval church. Oh, Massimiliano Locatelli in his 16th century church turned off a CLS architectural principal designs furniture and accessories. This is a church where this guy has his office. This look at this medieval church. They're selling them out for nickels and dimes. On, it, it, it's it, and everybody's silent and watching this. Really, so what can you do? We had a Rosary Crusade in Buffalo. You should see how you're going to get attacked. You wouldn't believe how you get it. You do this. Your Catholics come after you, but that's okay. This is what one of the churches in Buffalo. Just the the ceiling of it where I was baptized. We had lots of those churches. They're on the hands of Protestants now. A couple of them are mosques. The whole complex. They sold them for pennies. So okay. Anyway, okay, seven deaths in the last 24 hours from what in Erie County from opioids were saturated in them. Okay, the victims, predominantly male, they're coming after the young men, 71% and 87% between uh, white and 20, between 20 and 39, 59%. They're destroying our young men. Here's the headlines. You can look it up on the Internet. I won't bore you with the details, but seven deaths in 24 hours. New numbers, opioids, heroin. Kids from good families are dying from heroin in Buffalo, in droves. And the government's response, the government, which is all on the plan, we will have a program, and we're going to have a program. We're going to have so you, once that needle goes in a kid, 
that's a battle that's almost very miraculous to overcome. So, so they come up with a program. Well, they're not, I don't see them arrested the heroin peddlers. They don't. There's, you don't read about that in the paper. So new numbers in Erie County's heroin epidemic, okay, overwhelming. And that's what they do, and that's what the kids are doing in the streets. So what are you, what are we going to do here, okay? What are we going to do? Soldiers, who's the enemy? The devil, okay? Stand against the devil. It's a call to duty. It's spiritual warfare, but it's also practical warfare. You're at war, and you're a soldier, and if you're not doing anything, you're missing an action or AWOL, and you got to answer for failing the call. You have to answer for that. Put on the armor of God, so when the evil day comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Okay, here's the civil. Remember Churchill? Remember Mr. Churchill? And, of course, he was on turned Poland over after the war to the, to the Russians, the communists and everything. But this is what he said. This is a civil leader saying... And, and what about us soldiers of Christ? We shall go to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island at whatever the cost. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing routes. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets and in the hills and never surrender. What are we doing, soldiers of Christ? Nothing. And when we wonder why things are going bad, how are these bishops going to consecrate? We let them get away with murder and we all stand there. We actually took the diocese to court over. They sold this beautiful St. Gerard's Church that had this beautiful ark over it. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, Gate of heaven, uh, door to Christ, and they sold it to the Muslims for $120,000. One window in the church was worth that. We took them to court and the judge said, well, you know, Stacy, we know they did wrong, but it would embarrass the church. Do you really want to embarrass the church? I said, Yeah. <laughs> we did okay so where where are we okay you know are where are we fighting the powers of darkness where are the church's leaders okay where are the church's leaders now to get down and dirty we're fighting each other right the demons must be rolling around on the floors of hell laughing their heads off at us because here we are we are fighting each other. The ah, traditionalists this, they're fighting the traditionalists that. The, the priest is fighting this, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, people can't get together and talk to one another and work out their details and work out their, their difficulties. We're fighting one another. The devils are laughing their heads off. Ah, look at those Catholics. We're fighting everybody. There's the enemy, and the enemy is not each other. We have to learn to talk to one another. We have to learn to work with one another, okay? So if you fight them, I'm going to guarantee, I've done this, you will be attacked. Okay, you stand for God, you will be attacked. The demons will go after you, and if they can't get your, you, they'll get your children, your grandchildren, grandchildren, you'll be mock scorned and publicly humiliated and, and hated. But aren't we supposed to be Christ-like? I mean, who is Christ on the cross, right? That's what we have to look like. Wounded, torn up, bloody and bleeding because that's who we are following. So stop waiting for Superman to fly in and do the work. Phyllis Schlafly, a very wise woman whose organization broke up after her death. She's got two factions now. Okay. She basically said all politics is, is grassroots. So if 20 or 30,000 stood up and descended on church leaders, what could be done? But it won't get done till we clean our own houses. Read the New Testament daily. Read the epistles. Leave the, Live the words of Christ to bless those who curse us, and there's plenty of those. Pray to the Holy Ghost to guide us from a broken and humble heart and deal with our sinfulness first and repent. Repent some more. God loves a repentant and humble heart. Find a way to counsel these lost kids. My gosh, it's terrible. Give a kind word. Give them a few dollars. They're out of work. They're committing suicide, for goodness sake. Who's helping them? All right. Is the missionary work to talk to each other? No. It's to go out and help the lost, to bring these poor kids back. It'd be a blessing to everyone. Lead the lost to Christ by kindness. The word that you give might open the door to saving a soul. And here's an interesting thing, and I'm, I'm getting to, to the end, so I'll, I'll stop boring you, but here's, here's Sister Mary Buzek. She was interviewed by the Buffalo newspaper where she said she's voting for Hillary. And then because she didn't like, she thought Bernie Sanders was, of course, a registered Democrat. She is, uh, she was unrealistic. So, so what did she say? If you look at the bottom, I, I don't like the part about abortion. Hillary Clinton, woman who wanted abortion up to the ninth month of pregnancy, which is just the law of the land in the Supreme Court, but she said that's what she wanted. 
Here's a woman in nun clothes, a professed nun, saying she was voting for Hillary because she did so much for the poor. I'll bet for, for Hillary's own organization, God only knows what. But she said she didn't like the part about abortions. But she came out publicly and scandalized people, and people read this stuff in the paper, and they say, well, if the nun supports her, why can't I? It's scandal. It's scandal. So there's good prayers that you can use if you look in your missile, page 104, in my St. Joseph's. There's good prayer to say, O oh God, you know that placed as we are amid such great dangers, we cannot by reason of our human frailty stand. Grant us health of mind and body, that by your help we may overcome the things which we suffer for our sins. Silence, a sin of silence. The sin that we didn't maybe take our kids to confessional. I mean, everybody's got them. We've got loads of sins. There's no lack of sins. You know, that's a good prayer to say. And look what we have here. This is what they do in Ramadan. You see all those Muslims out there? 10,000 people to the gay march in Buffalo, and people don't want to come out to save babies. This is a school in the United States where they're making kids. This is how Muslims pray. They're teaching them in the public school classrooms. So what happens? Basically, you know the handle's Messiah, and it sort of morphed one into the other. We, like sheep, have gone astray, every one to his own way. And we got to remember who the enemy is. The enemy is not flesh and blood. And you think about the enemy out there, just remember one thing. The Hillary Clintons, the people advocating all these warped things, are the enemy. But you always have to think that basically the enemy is the principalities and power. So they may have their puppet working for them, but you got to understand it's the devil who's inspiring people to do evil, whether it's a Soros or it's a Putin or it's, and it's, it, the, and, and we really should pray to convert these people because it's spiritual wickedness in high places. So Ephesians 6, 13 to 18, you're a soldier supposed to put on the armor of God and what to do. Okay. Stop preaching to the choir. There's all these lonely people, dying kids and everything. Go out and work with the people who don't have anybody, okay? Instruct the ignorant. Isn't that one of the works of mercy? We're supposed to instruct the ignorant, counsel the doubtful. That's what we should do. So we shouldn't let a day go by without reading the New Testament. Here's a prayer for priests. I have it from 1948, written by Bishop Noel, April 18th. It's got an indulgence. And basically he's praying for the poor lost priests. The poor lost priests who basically need to return back to the church. He was praying for them. You need to pray for them. And good old William Shakespeare said, How far that little candle throws his beams, so shines a good deed in the naughty world. One little thing that you do is like a candle on the water, casting its light. Every day, every day, you're supposed to do that. And uh, here's the prayer to St. Michael, not the prayer you know. That's, it's back of a chap that I, I found. So these things keep coming my way. O glorious Prince St. Michael, chief and commander of the heavenly hosts, guardian of souls, vanquisher of rebel spirits, servant in the house of the divine king, and our admirable conductor, thou who shines with excellence and superhuman virtue, vouchsafe to deliver us from all evil, who turn to thee with confidence and enable us by your gracious protection to serve God more and more faithfully every day. We have we have angels and saints and everybody to stand by us. We're not alone. We're not lone wolves. We have all this power of heaven and saints and everything. Why don't we call on them to help us? Does any was anybody here ever in the Holy Name Society? Way back in the way back machine, Holy Name. They have they have a song. And it's a beautiful song. You don't hear it sung in church. I wanted to bring it into one of those traditional churches, and they want to throw me out in the garbage can because how dare I say this stuff? But it's we stand for God and uh, we stand for God and for our, our Savior. Um, and, and here's where it goes: Strengthen our fate, Redeemer. Guard us when danger is nigh. To Thee we pledge our lives in service. For God we live, and God will die. To Thee we pledge our lives in service. For God we live, and God for God we die. We stand for God, Jesus our Master. He's died for us with love untold, his law divine and truth unchanging. In this land, our, their play, in this our land, their place must hold. Strengthen our faith, Redeemer. Guard us when danger is nigh. To thee we pledge our lives in service. For thee we live, for God will die. Alfred Lauren Tennyson. More things are wrought by prayer in this world than people deliver us. If you don't have the prayer of St. Joseph for safety and travel, I'll give you one. So, the Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Why are we afraid of some perverted or, or, or twisted hierarch or some priest who's off the... Why are we afraid of them? We have, we have the truth 
and they are lost souls as bad as anybody else. And we ha- don't be afraid to talk to them, confront them, pray for them, send them literature to wake them up. Whom shall I be afraid of? I was sitting there one day and I had my cell phone like we all do. And I was, I was in the middle of some terrible conflict. And believe me, I get slammed around all the time. And on my cell phone, I didn't ask for it. You know how they text you, people text you? This, this thing came up. I said, don't, I, I was really in a, I, I, everything was just, a, it was something very bad. And this thing came, I didn't put it in there and nobody said it. He says, don't panic, Christian. But when things go bad, remember, don't panic, Christian. God is an ever present help in trouble. He's there for us. Remember the hallelujah chorus? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and he shall reign forever. So what side are you on? You're working, are you working for the enemy or are you working as a soldier of Christ? And I found this thing also, it's, I don't mean it to be disrespectful. The devil says they're all mine and Jesus responds over my dead body. Right? So that being said, last words. Okay. We, we got to stop working against each other and we have to learn to communicate and disagree. You know, all these, okay, you're on the wrong side. You're out. You're in this one. Get over it. We're on the same army, right? We're supposed to be on the same army. And then do you really think that the people that there's no hell and we all go to heaven and, and, and then burn the leftovers like so much trash? You know, everybody, they, when I was growing up, the nuns said only pagans burn their body. What do they do now? You're dead, you know, your life is over, you're gonna have a party, and, and, and here's a, you're supposed to go pray to an urn at some funeral house. I don't think so. But the most spectacular churches and doors are being closed in our faces. I'm stuck, this won't go forward. Well, whatever it is, there's, there's, I guess maybe that's the last slide. So, look, they're not gonna, these people who are on the wrong side, they're not gonna preach against abortion, contraception, which is, a, and the sins crying out to heaven for vengeance. We have to get off our easy chairs and work, and only then will things change. So, you, we have to do the work, alright? And basically, you've read it in scriptures, what happens when the shepherd is gone, the sheep scatter. But we, like sheep, have gone astray, everyone to his own way. We better pull together, because we're on the same army. And if we don't recognize that and work with people to remind them, we are on the same army, and you are a soldier. You're a soldier of Jesus Christ. You, whether you like it or not, you took that, you went up there, you got confirmed, okay? So that's the story. And if you go into the military, and you're going to solemnly swear that you will support and defend the Constitution, you better solemnly swear that you will support the gospel of Jesus Christ and be that soldier. Otherwise, you are defaulting on your duty and you're going to have to answer for it someday. So get busy and God bless you and don't give up the fight because it's a fight. Thanks.